Hey everybody, so glad you're with me. Today we're going to talk about seven unique ways that God is at work when we worship and when we lead worship. I'm speaking mostly to worship leaders today. And I don't know about you, but when I bring forth my effort to lead God's people into worship, I just so want to know that He's at work through my life and He's doing His miracles in our midst while we're worshiping Him. And so I'm going to just go through some seasons in my life where I've learned different things that He's been doing while we were worshiping. So, act number one, how God is at work when we worship is when we worship, we declare the truth. The truth is being uh, proclaimed. And um, one of the first memories of my life was when I was five years old, around that time, my mom would play the hymns on her baby grand piano. And actually the family would gather around and begin to sing those hymns. And I remember falling asleep, oh, so peacefully under that grand piano, listening to the sound of those hymns. Little did I know that the truth of God's word was being planted so deep in my heart as a little kid. And when we worship and when we gather, that oh so important truth that leads us and guides us is being planted in our hearts. As I record this right now, we're still in the midst of this pandemic in 2020. And that's been one of the hardest things is we haven't been able to gather and declare the truth because when we let the truth in worship come out of our own mouths, we affirm what we believe and what is true over our lives and over the life of the person next to us. And so that's why it's so incredibly important. We live in a world that's not just skeptical of God's word and God's truth. Uh, they're enemies of it. They hate it. They want us to recant it and denounce it and doubt it. So it's so important that we keep declaring what is actually true. Colossians 3.16 says, Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with gratitude in your heart. Did you hear that? We declare the, the message of Christ through psalms and hymns and spiritual songs through worship. It's no wonder that it's mentioned around 200 times in the Bible to sing unto the Lord. You know, way back when Paul wrote those words, there was no New Testament. So the way the word was passed on was orally, through speaking it out and teaching it and singing it. So we're just being part of a, our Christian church tradition throughout the ages when we sing and declare um, God's truth. And you know, it's no secret that when we uh, declare the truth with music and with song, that it goes deep to the deepest places of our soul that we're able to take it in through music. So it's so important and so powerful. It's one of the ways we hear God's Word. It says, faith comes by hearing in Romans and hearing of the Word of God through the truth. So number one, God's truth is proclaimed. Number two, evangelism happens. So I was 11 years old and this amazing, true, authentic revival called the Jesus Movement was happening. And I was with all these hippies. I was the youngest hippie, but I was there. And I remember watching those hippies just with tears in their eyes pouring out their heart to God, and it was in the midst of a worship service that I sensed God's presence for the first time. I'm so grateful. In fact, the older I get, the more grateful I am that I grew up in a Christian home and was introduced to who Jesus was. But he was just this entity that I knew about. But in that moment, in God's presence, in the midst of a worship service, for the first time, I sensed God's presence. I sensed him telling me he was there, he was with me, he loved me. And it was really through watching those other worshipers, because you know what was happening? When they were worshiping God, they were putting on display their personal relationship 
with God. It, I call it the gospel in motion. I was watching them tell Jesus they love him as they were simultaneously receiving his love. And that's when God's presence came. That's when my conversion came. That's when I really received my calling, was in the midst of all those people crying out to God and worshiping him. Um, it's just a way that we're able to show non-believers not only our relationship with God, but it's a way that we can show them what we're inviting them to, what we're inviting them to become. We're inviting them to be a part of our family, this family of believers, of Christ followers. That's a hopefully a grateful, humble family that just is there to express our gratefulness to a God who's shown us grace and mercy. We don't want to hide from them what they're, we're asking them to be a part of. So worship brings evangelism. That's what happened to me. And I thought about it years later, by the way. No wonder I became a worship leader. Uh, at the deepest part of my soul, I want other non-believers to um, receive Christ in the way I did. In fact, it's my, my uh, life mission statement to inspire all people to become worshipers of the Most High God. Number three, worship is spiritual warfare. When I, was, um, when I went to Bible school, I went to a Bible school that let us all experiment with what spiritual warfare was. And at the time, a lot of the students, I mean, it just seemed like Everyone was finding a demon under every rock, and, and I kind of got turned off by that. But then I did realize, and I did learn, that worship can be a weapon. And in ancient times, uh, there was a thing that before the battle would begin, the commanders would come out, the leaders of each army, and do what they would call boasting. And basically, it was trash-talking each other before they would begin, which is really funny to me. But uh, with the story of uh, David and Goliath, it was really the same thing. Samuel 17, 5, David said to the Philistine, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty. When we worship, we simultaneously remind the enemy and remind ourselves that the victorious King of Kings is on our side. And when life looks dark and grim and hopeless, we're able to shout and repeat what is true. God is good. He is faithful. He is with me. He is worthy. He is powerful. He is not against me. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against his church and his kingdom will stand and last forever and ever and I'm a part of that kingdom you can declare those things that are true and remind the enemy and remind yourself and remind the people around you this God is on my side I mean one of the greatest examples of this I think is and I don't know if you've thought about this and realized this but one of the last things Jesus did before he went to the cross to die for you at the end of the Last summer, Supper, it says that they sang a hymn together. Before he faced that darkness, the sins of the world, he worshipped. He sang a hymn. He, he spoke with his mouth, with his singing, the truth and, uh, in worship. What an, amazing, what an amazing thought that is. So get in your car and crank up your worship music and sing along and declare it and in defiant worship. <laughs> Come against the enemy in that way. Whatever it is, how you want to do it, uh, get in your backyard and shout out those psalms and read them. Declare what is true. And God will fight those battles for you. Number four, intimacy with God happens when we worship. Um, after I had come back from a missions trip 
And it, it, was one, it wasn't the greatest, turned out to be not the greatest experience for me. I came back kind of disillusioned and discouraged and very tired and, and weary. And at that time I was house sitting a house for somebody, so I was living alone and somebody gave me the devotional classic, The Pursuit of God by A.W. Tozer. So there I was living alone in this house and every night I would read a chapter out of that devotional book and all of a sudden God began to meet me in an amazing, real, deep way. I mean, God's presence, I mean, I kept looking around like I just sensed I was going to see see him in person. It was so fantastic and, and so amazing and I began to worship him every night and I realized that through this book that worship is one of the ways that we go beyond just knowing about God, things that are true about him, but it's a way that we can know God personally. One of my favorite verses is Psalms 25, 14. Friendship with the Lord is with those who fear Him. Or you could say, with those who reverence Him. Or you could say, those who truly worship Him. It says, with them, He tells the secrets of His covenant. I feel like the, a good example of how God tells us His secrets is Romans 8.16. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. I mean, have you ever been worshiping? And it was almost even beyond your intellect. You just, there was just a knowing, kind of a weight of His glory, a knowing, wow, the God of the universe. He's here. He's with me. He's in me. He's telling me. He loves me. He's telling you those secrets of His covenant with you, His promise to always love you and be with you. That happens in worship. No wonder I hear stories over and over again, and myself included, the worship begins. Even non-believers begins and people begin to weep. Why is it? Because God is giving the secrets. He's telling of His love in the midst of His presence, in the midst of the worship. He's bringing and inviting intimacy through worship. So powerful, so wonderful. What a, what a wonderful thing, right? To be able to bring, as a worship leader, to bring the closeness and intimacy of a relationship with God through worship to people. Number five. Worship brings back the wonder. And this is one of my favorites. Um, so then next season of my life, I'm from El Paso, Texas, and I loaded up my El Camino and headed down the 10 freeway and moved to Hollywood, California to go to music school because I wanted to learn how to worship God with the, as much excellence as I could possibly do. When I was there at the school, um, a musician named Justo Almario, just a really world-renowned uh, sax player, was there. And I happened to know he was a Christian because at the time he was in a band called Koinonia, who I was a huge fan of. And he was there basically playing a worship song on his saxophone. And just the excellence and the beauty in which it was played, it was just a, like I was just seeing the glory and beauty of the Lord in front of me. I was just so in awe, just awestruck. <laughs> and um, Psalm 66 says, make his praise glorious. Make it like that, you know. And for us musicians and singers who are worshipers, that's part of our job, part of our calling is to bring the beauty and the wonder of who God is to people so that they can see it. Jeremiah 32, 17 says, Ah, oh, Lord God, behold, Thou hast made the heavens and the earth with Your great power and outstretched arm. I love that verse starts with the word, Ah. Oh. It's kind of like one of those words um, when you don't even have a word to say. It's just, ah. Oh. Kind of like, wow. <laughs> it's beyond words how great our God is. Sadly, Christians and Christians 
can so quickly become unimpressed and kind of bored with God. We have this tendency to keep shrinking him down to our own size that we can completely comprehend him and explain him and understand him. But when we're a person of wonder, we have like this child, childlike faith that just knows how to enjoy and bask in the fact that we could never comprehend the vastness of this eternal God. And if we could, we would be God, right? But we want to be a people uh, that can enjoy knowing that we could never completely explain him. And like I said, that's, that's one of our jobs as worship leaders and as musicians and as singers. You know, I believe that as soon as we become unimpressed with God, as soon as we lose the ahs, the ohs and the ahs before God, we'll begin to stray away. We'll become bored. We'll, become, we'll move on to the next thing. We need to keep worshiping and being in awe of Him. Amen. Number six, worship brings unity. Um, after I went to mu music school, I found Christian Assembly, which, um, by the way, I've now been here as when you see this video for basically 30 years, and I'm so grateful to have found a place that has been my home, a place where I have lived my life in one faith community and raised my children. And, um, but when I first came to Christian Assembly, which by the way, back to the previous story, Justo Omario, that amazing sax player who I was always a fan of, when I went to Christian Assembly, Justo was there, and I've got to share so all these years in worship with him uh, here until recently. And so when I came to Christian Assembly, my idea of what a, a really deep, strong, amazing Christian was, was whoever was stayed in the prayer closet the longest, which is certainly a huge part of it. But I think one of the biggest things I learned from Pastor Mark Pickrell here, who has been so wonderful to me, through all these years, and now Pastor Tom Hughes, is that your Christianity isn't really tested in the prayer closet. Where it's tested is how we love and forgive the people around us, our family and friends and our coworkers. That's how we know when our Christianity is real. And, um, and I tell you what, as as I'm recording this video even now, and I don't want to get into uh, news updates or anything because it's going to be seen in the future, but man, with what's going on in our country and in our world, like never before do we as Christians need to show unity and love and forgiveness. I mean, we need to be the great forgivers of the world because we follow the great forgiver, Jesus. And worship brings... Uh, a beauty and uniqueness of unity like um, few things can. I mean, if you think about it, you're declaring what's true about God, but when you do it in song, you, let's just say you're saying He is worthy. You're saying it simultaneously at the exact same time as all the other people in your congregation. Rhythmically the same, melodically the same, clapping maybe in sync, all these things at the same time, the same way, and it brings such a unity. And on top of that, when we worship, we tend to um, accentuate the things about God that we all already know that we agree on <laughs> instead of that way we disagree on. And I'm telling you, there is power beyond what we could ever know in unity and in agreement. Jesus says the world's going to know that I'm the Messiah, that I'm Him, if and when you love each other. Let's let worship bring us together and unite us like never before. What a wonderful thought to know as a worship leader, I'm a unifier. Or as a worship leader, you're a unifier. You're one of the people that's not on Facebook telling all the other Christians how you hate them because you disagree with them or whatever. We're one of the people that's bringing unity to the body of Christ, showing the world, showing the people outside, we love each other, we forgive each other. 
And uh, I know that I want to be that, and I'm grateful that through worship I can be a unifier. Uh, Psalm 133 says, How good and pleasant it is when we dwell together in unity. That's where God bestows His blessing, and we've all experienced that blessing. One more story. Um, years ago, I was in Israel, and I had the amazing gift of leading a, a big conference there in Jerusalem. And so we had a, a day to tour the land, so my worship team and I went to uh, looking around Jerusalem, and we went to the garden tomb, and we were there in the empty tomb, and Linda McCrary, uh, my precious friend who's sung with me all around the world, began to sing the hymn, I Know My Redeemer Lives, in the empty tomb, <laughs> that song of resurrection. And as she began to sing it, people from, we realized, from the nations, because we heard them speaking these different languages, began gathering around right out in front of the empty tomb, and it, it not only was just one of the most amazing experiences of hearing the sound of a resurrection song in the tomb where Jesus rose from the dead, but what hit me even more was when I saw all those believers from all over the world gathering there, and when I was there inside the tomb with my worship team, it was the love and the unity that got me, the love that grew in my heart for all these people, for all these believers. And it was almost an audible voice. I just, I heard, the Spirit of Christ is a spirit of unity. It's not a spirit of competition. It's a spirit of unity and love. Let's do everything we can do to be a, a people of unity and love. Amen. Our last point, number seven. Endurance. I just had a landmark birthday the other day. I'm not going to tell you what it was, but uh, when you get older, you kind of are in shock and awe when you hear the, or have to write down your age on a piece of paper. But I will say I'm grateful for God's faithfulness. And for all you younger worship leaders out there, uh, man, don't forget to honor the older folks because if they're still following Jesus, I guarantee you they've gone through some things you haven't gone through, and it's so wonderful to have the generations together and have people that have stayed faithful. But in my older age, I have had times, and believe me, times in just this year where I've experienced a lot of loss and grief, and my faith has taken some beatings. And... Um, and I tell myself, don't forget the joy of the Lord is your strength to fight for and run to the joy of the Lord. But one of the powerful things about worship is it's about focusing. It's about fixing your eyes on Him. It's about gazing upon the beauty of the Lord. The Christian life, as the Bible says, it's like running a race. And you cannot run and finish and win the race if you don't have your sights set on the finish line. And Philippians 3.14 says, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Hebrews 12.2 says, Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. When we keep our fix upon Him and His beauty and His power and His ability to take care of us and to remember His faithfulness, to remember His mighty acts throughout our life. We're able to make it to the finish line. When I was saving up to go to music school and living, still living in Texas, I worked, worked a bunch of jobs that I just hated. I hated those jobs. But I will say they motivated me to work hard to be able to do what God has allowed me to do because I, I was so not wanting to uh, do those jobs. But um, I knew that I was saving up to go to music school and move to California. I knew I was heading to this next step. And so I could endure a lot because I was looking forward, because I was focused. I had my sights set on what was next. We need to have our sights set on Jesus, and then we can endure to the end. And that's what worship is, is focusing upon Him.
Amen. So in closing, this is just seven things that I've found God doing in worship. And we know that He's doing measureless, unknown amounts of work as we serve. And, and let me just say, you have to contend to believe that He is at work, especially when it seems discouraging. But He is doing more than you could ever imagine or think. Um, in a couple days, I'm going to be um, flying to Texas, and I'm going to get to see my 94-year-old dad. He's currently 94 years old. Fred Walker, retired pastor. I haven't gotten to see him in quite a while because of this pandemic. But every time I see him, because his memory is fading, he says, Tommy, uh, what are you doing? What's going on in your life? Because he forgets what I'm doing. I said, well, Dad, I'm leading people in worship. And I'm thinking to myself, that's what I've given my whole entire life to. <laughs> and he says, Tommy, and he says it, you know, just with the kind of authority that only a 94-year-old 94 year retired pastor could say, he says, Tommy, let me tell you, if you're leading people in worship, you're doing a good work. And I'm telling you, when he says that to me, I receive it as the Word of God. I say, Lord, I'm just trusting you that what I'm doing is a faithful way of serving you, that it is a good work. And I'm telling you, take it from Fred Walker as being from God. Stay faithful. Keep going. Don't give up. Be encouraged. You are doing a good work. And God is doing all the things that we just spoke of just now when you faithfully lead. What a blessing. What an honor to serve him in this way. I hope this has been an encouragement to you. Amen. God bless.